Hi, everyone. Welcome back to our little green pasture. God bless you. Welcome back and welcome to everybody who is new to this channel. Maybe you're just stopping by and checking it out. Everyone's welcome. Like I always call this place, it's more than a channel. It's a little green pasture. So feel free to take up a little grassy knoll and join us for some living water and for some fresh manna. So um, I'm feeling better today and praise the Lord. I always expect that from the Lord because he is good. Amen. Well, today I'm going to talk about loving not the world or the things in the world. And I want to talk about the divisions, the sovereign divisions of God. I had spoken about that in another message a long, long time ago, but something different came this way today. It came this morning and it was so living and alive, like a flowing brook. And I said, Lord, I just want to share that with other people because, you know, when God gives you a message, it's from within, it's, it's coming from within, you know, and I believe true preaching truly is, it truly is artesian. I love something Charles Spurgeon said. He said, you cannot preach conviction of sin unless you have suffered it. You cannot preach repentance unless you have practiced it. You cannot preach faith unless you have exercised it. True preaching is artesian. It wells up from the great depths of the soul. If Christ has not made a well within us, there will be no outflow from us. Isn't that true? And can't you really tell the difference from a person who is speaking and it's coming from somewhere else, from another source, and it's alive, and your ears perk up to it. Because I totally know the difference when I'm just listening to just regular talking. And I mean, the message could be good, but it's not a life-giving source. There's, there's, there's nothing life-giving to it. But there's something about that word that Jesus says, he that believeth upon me, as the scripture saith, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So that tells me the source is not from me. Uh, I like to call it living at the well. I know you guys hear me say that often, but I always want to say that because I do live at the well. And so we draw waters from him, right? So before I get started, I am going to pray and I'm just going to dive right in. Amen. Father in heaven, it is with supreme and great joy to be able to come before you on another day. Another day, Lord Jesus, that this sower can go forth to sow. And that, Lord Jesus, I do so with joy set before me. I thank you, Lord God, for the cross that has become ours. That, Lord, that if we are truly followers of you, then we are daily picking up our cross and following after you. And that cross belongs to us. And and I pray, Lord Jesus, that today you will be glorified, that you will have the preeminence in this word. As you know, Lord God, I'm trusting in the flow of your Holy Spirit. And I ask you, Lord Jesus, to give me the capability, Lord, to be able to speak your word and to say it exactly how I'm hearing it from within and how I was hearing you this morning. Touch the hearts and the minds and the lives of every single person that will be listening to this word. And Lord, I decrease that you may increase. And I pray, Lord, that you open up ears to hear your voice because, Lord, there is a sound to your voice that people will hear, not my own. Let them hear your voice. Be in the center of it all, Jesus. And I praise you and I commit now this word unto you for your name's sake for your glory's sake, for your truth's sake, in Jesus' name, amen. So I really didn't have any plans of doing a message today, but today I just felt the inflooding, the rushing in of the waters of the Spirit. And it was well after I had done my devotions and enjoyed that word this morning just between me and the Lord. And it was much later on. And all of a sudden, I started thinking about that word in 1 John 2, 15 through 
Many of you are familiar with it, and I'm going to talk to you about it today, just as I believe how I was receiving it from the Holy Spirit. I'm trying to get comfortable here. <laughs> so it says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it is of the world, and the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Little children, it is the last time. And as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Isn't that just so condensed? I mean, he says it like four different times. They went out, the they and us, they and us, they and us, they and us. Um, and I want to talk about what happens about that sovereign division of God and the way that I believe I've experienced it in my own life and still experience it to this day. And, and what I believe is uh, happening and has been continuing happening since the true gospel has been preached. And, you know, listen, nowadays there's so many different Bibles out there. There's so many different translations of the Bible. And and we're living nowadays in such a liberal uh, society that even the so-called churches of God are agreeing and consenting to the most wicked deeds of this world. And, and they're saying it's rights and they have to agree with what's happening. And, you know, look, I'll tell you, God has to make a division between those who serve God, those who don't. It says in Malachi 3.18, God himself says, for I will again put a difference between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. In another place, it says, if a man loves God, the same is known of him. And in another place, it says, unto them that believe, he is precious. And, you know, when I see this, there's one, two, three, four, five, six times in John 15, First uh, John chapter 2, in the first and 15 and 16, six times, um, I said six times, right? One, two, three, four. Yeah, six times John condenses the word. I noticed that this book is so, so rich because, I mean, I don't have it in front of me right now. I do have it, but there's so many times he talks about love, okay? And so love is such the strong point of John's book. He was the last living disciple. He was old when he wrote this book. And tons of times, I don't even have it how many times it's written, but it says, um, the word love, loveth, and beloved is written in that book in five chapters, 51 times. 13 times he says, we know, we know, we know, we know. That is so important because it's like honey. It's so ultra super condensed. And so many times he says, little children, I haven't written down the number, but it is, he says, little children, little children, little children. He's always talking to little children. And because Jesus always referred to not just the little children, but he referred to as his adult followers as little children. Even Jeremiah said, I am but a little child. And so when we really see Jesus Christ, and we really get a glimpse of God by the revelation of the Holy Spirit, we are reduced to that of little children. And there's nothing in us that wants to be lifted up and puffed up with knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love, it edifies. Love speaks so much powerfully than a bunch of words not, not bathed in love. And we can read about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 
I mean, I can look at it right now because um, I'm just going with the flow of the spirit. First Corinthians uh, 13, the first three verses, he says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, which is another word for love, Old English. I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profits me nothing. So we see three demonstrations. If you could, you could be the best orator, you can be um and i'm not even saying you know it's a give me with people who go to divinity schools you know or maybe a couple two-year college schools or whatever but if if anybody can just speak anybody can be a trained speaker and they can and they can even speak with an eloquence of an angelic like they looked upon stephen's face the pharisees and they said his face was like that of an angel and there's like an angelic quality to certain people who speak, but there's something hollow about it and the spirit detects it. And that's how you can say, well, I'm hearing the person, they speak eloquently, but there's no life giving power. It's not vivified by the spirit. There's no evidence that there's even any prayer or power behind it. It's just empty, knowledgeable words. And then it talks about having gifts of prophecy and understanding all mysteries and all knowledge and having all faith that could literally remove mountains. What good is it if there is no love? What good is it? It says, yeah, I've become nothing. And the first one is you're just a, you're just a sound of a drum that's banging in the background or some tinkling cymbal. You're just a noise. And though he's and though you give everything you have to the poor and then literally give your entire body away it doesn't matter it says there's no profit to it you know why because you did it all those three demonstrations um are empty i can't even see the life of god in that you know i was thinking i was uh thinking about simon magus when philip came into town and he continued with them many it says and he was watching philip lead people to christ and do all these things and then he wanted to ex to receive christ i'm just putting it in a nutshell and so he got baptized and continued with them many days and he was watching philip lay hands on people and he said uh to philip he said how much would it cost me to have you lay hands on me that I may receive this power? And Peter turned uh, and uh, and Peter was there at that point anyways, but he turned and rebuked him and he said, thy money perish with you for you thought that you could purchase the uh, gift of God with money. I, I discern that you are not, you are in the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. Your heart is not right with the, in you. And now you shall dwell in a dark mist for days. And he didn't, he, he was so puffed up. He said, pray for me that this won't be so instead of, and, and Peter was telling him, pray that you be forgiven of this. And he said, you pray for me. You know, I'll tell you something. There is a division that will eventually happen. God makes the division. And don't think that he makes the division as soon as everybody gets to the point of death or lives a long time. Truly the work of the Holy Spirit is evident uh, the life of Jesus Christ is evident in people's lives, whether they be young or old, because I've seen many people that are newly born again, and I've watched them grow in that born again experience. And it wasn't just an experience. It was real. It was a new creation. Something happened to them and they knew it. And they went on and they learned and they grew and they just kept growing like cedars of Lebanon, which the Lord hath planted. There was something alive in them. I, and even as an older Christian, I've been around younger Christians where I've been like, I love it. I love that life because I detect the life of God in them and it's alive and it's a burning. Isn't it just a wonderful thing? I mean, I love what Jesus said about uh, John the Baptist. He says, you were, he says he was a burning and a light and you were willing for a season to believe in that light, but there is a greater light. 
Jesus himself being the light of the world. And, you know, so many people are so willing to believe in lesser lights. You know, I think about when God created, you know, he even caused a division. He said in the beginning, uh, in the beginning, uh, he said, in in the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. There's your division, he heaven and earth. Now it's become heaven and hell. And the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And then it goes on to talk about him dividing the sea from the land and so forth and so on. So in the beginning, God makes differentiation between two worlds. He talks about heaven and he talks about earth. We know that it says in Hebrews chapter 11 through 3, it says, though through faith we understand the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen are not made of things which do appear. And so when I read this, this word came to me before I even opened it up. I read it in my Bible. And of course, I'm familiar with it. But I just see John just so richly condensing, love not the world. You know, and this word love, I mean, we're talking about this man has said 51 times he talks about love, loveth and uh, beloved. And so love means something that your heart is invested in. You get something from it. You love it or you wouldn't want to be a part of it. And whatever you love that's the first thing you give attention to. That's the last thing you give attention to. And what you love, you make an idol. And God says, we're not to have any other gods before us. We're not to even make any graven images of things in the earth, things on the earth and things in the sea or things under the sea. And so when they're, and he's talking to believers, this, this is a letter to the church, to the body of Jesus Christ. Because it's a give me that sinners are going to love this world. They're of this world. They're of this earth earthy. But he's talking to people because there's an issue. There's people that love the world. They love everything about it. Now, let me just say this. And I know it really goes without saying it. But for those that maybe might be going, well, Joan, we're in this world. What, we're not supposed to love anything. If you have that kind of attitude after you've read that word, um, let me just give you some soft uh, some um, soft redirection. Look, we're in this world, but we're not of this world, Jesus says. Jesus says, you are no more of this world any more than I am of this world. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, he tells us, uh, you are in the world, but use it lightly. Don't use it. Don't, don't you know, just uh, use it, but don't abuse it. Don't let it own you. And don't because listen whatever you love you begin to let it control you and it will control you and you won't even realize you're being controlled by something you love until it starts to be taken away from you and you know a lot of times god will smash something down in our life and he will take it away because he sees that ultimately it's destroying and will destroy up the road your faith in him and God loves you enough in his great mercy to smash down the idols we set in our heart. So when he says, love not the world, he starts right off, love not the world. Now, of course, we enjoy beautiful scenery. We want to go and be refreshed at the beach. We want to go by springs and fountains and waters and all those things. And we do love them, but not the kind of love that makes us love this world. This world is passing away. This world is not our home. We have been bought with a price. We are born again. We are new creatures. We are people that are being prepared every day to go to a prepared place. And so he's saying, don't love the world because whatever you love, you start to emulate. You start to sound like, you start to walk like the world. You start to sound like the world then he goes on to say neither the things that are in the world look 
Godliness with contentment is great gain, Paul tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 6. He says, for you have brought nothing into this world, and it's certain you're going to take nothing out. And so we know that things can control us. I mean, look at look at people who own a lot of things. They own, you know, they, they, they just have a lot of possessions. You know, possessions can own a person. I mean, sometimes we look... And we go, look at that person has a beautiful home or they have a vacation house on top of that. And look at their beautiful cars and look at, you know, they can go anywhere they want and everything. But I promise you this, that if you stripped those people down of their money, let's say they woke up one morning and there was no money left in their bank accounts, we'll see what kind of people they really are. Because you see, those people are living for those things. They're living, they love this world. They love the things that are in this world because you know what? Listen, things don't make people great. God makes people great in faith, great in love. And he He makes himself great in this world through us. So the things that we have, we are to live with godly simplicity and sincerity in Jesus Christ. I mean, and you can tell like if you get things and all of a sudden you're related but then if you don't get to shop or you don't get to go places and you go in a downbeat, downer mood, um, you know, we're all a work in progress. OK, there's no snap of a finger and all of a sudden we're ultra holy, um, but we're always a work in progress. But he says, love, not the world. This is not a recommendation. This is not a suggestion. He's telling us, don't do it. He's telling the body of Christ, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. He says, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You see the divide. Because when you love God, when you love Jesus Christ, that means that you have given your life over to him completely, making him master of your life, master and Lord, like I spoke in my last video, that he is master of your time and your eternity. There's no second wheelhouse. There's no second causes. He is articulating you, walking you through your life. And you know what? It says also too, and I want to get over here right now because it's popping into my mind. Um, uh, second, um, uh, second, Col uh, sorry, second Corinthians, not second Colossians, second Corinthians chapter 11. And he says, um, would to God, verse one, you could bear with me a little in my folly and indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So what he's saying here is, look, God sees us as, I mean, we are the bride of Christ. He we, and, and Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. And he's saying, I've, I have espoused you, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. And he says, for I've espoused you to one husband. Okay. So in other words, Love when you're loving the world and the things of this world, that means that you're putting your love into another person, the God of this age. Because the God of this age defiles the mind, He uses subtlety. And just like it says, He says, I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through with subtlety. So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Notice that so many people of this postmodern Christian era, um, it's too simple for them just to believe. They want to have something that makes them feel like they're getting full of in intellectual wisdom and, and they're growing in this powerful knowledge. But yet they have all faith. They, have, they can speak with tongues of angels. They can do all these things but they have never, ever been in love with God. And when you love God, it is, it's a revelation. He opens your eyes to another world because he says six times, 
love not the world, neither the things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the father is not in him, point blank. He is not going to make room. He's not going to share you with the world. It's either him or it's the God of this age. And through the subtlety and the corruption that's in this world and the filthiness of this world. And it's a different light. It's a light, but he'll shine his light. He masquerades. He trans Satan transforms himself as an angel of light. He says, um, it is no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. I want to share a dream I had with you last week. So last week, one day, and I believe I, I believe it was probably not even that long ago, but it doesn't matter. I'll just say a few days ago. So I had a dream of a pastor. Um, I used to go to this church a long time ago. And uh, he's still preaching. Um, I don't even know why I dreamed it, but I dreamed it. And here's what I dreamed. In my dream, I was standing in his kitchen. And I knew it was a Sunday. And I can see him and his family getting ready for church. You know how they're going back and forth. Everybody's, where's this? Where's my this and that? And, and I'm standing in the kitchen and I'm looking and I see the oven is on. And I looked down and I saw those big, you know, those big, huge sacks that look like sacks of flour or sacks of whatever, the big ones, like the huge ones. And they were leaning, there was like several of them leaning against the cabinet underneath the stove. And the stove was up high. And I looked down and, the, and it said wheat. And then um, his wife came in and she kind of smiled, went away. One of his children came in and, and she smiled and just kind of went her way. And then he and so as I, and so I was like, okay, you know, um, so I look on the counter and there's a bag about this big and it was leaning against the back wall and it said wheat on it. And I, I picked it up, you know, when you pick up an empty carton of milk and your hand goes like this, cause you think it's going to be heavy. So I pick up this bag like this and it was like light as a feather. So my hand went up. And so when it went up, it was pouring out. Everything out of it was like pouring out, like there was a huge hole in it. I was like, oh my gosh. Like, and so I immediately went like this. I righted it up and I saw like a huge hole, like a huge hole was at the bottom of the bag and it was still pouring out on the counter and it looked weird. And I was saying to myself, what kind of wheat is this? And I looked down and all it was, was the husks, the chaff was coming out of that bag and there was some burnt. I saw like three, um, I looked down because I put my hand in it to go, what is this? And you know, because it's that chap, it was all stuck to my hand. And I looked down and there was like three kernels of wheat and they were burnt. And I looked up and he was standing there and I said, what are you doing with this wheat? And he said, I'm putting it in the oven. You know, I had a dream about the same person many years ago where I went into the back of his church he was up there preaching and I looked at all of his chairs where the people sit, but instead there was potted plants and in, instead of people in every chair and all the plants were sickly, like yellowy and malnourished and dying. And I had another dream. And so what I want to say is there's when there's no life giving flow, a person can have a church. They can have the thing on the wall. They can have a staff. They can have a prayer team. They can have a children's ministry. They can have all these things. And, you know, they have nowadays these websites where you see all these people and everybody looks like they're having a great time and they're laughing and it's saying women's ministry and they're doing all these things. But you know what? That church is a church I went to for quite a while, many, many years ago, but yet it is dead. And I know it's a dead church and it's dead to this day. And so when I saw it, it was just chaff. So what, and it, he was burning the wheat and it's like, why would you kill off that life force of that wheat? And it was all chaff and just a few kernels of burnt wheat. So that was pretty powerful. Let me go on. Um, so he goes on to say, 
for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the father, but of the world. And the world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. And the he that does the will of God is the man or woman who loves the Lord, whose will becomes their will. And everything has to do with I putting the Lord before me. They're in his word. They're living at the well. They're desiring his light that has that. And, you know, I think of that word um, in his light. Shall we see light that light is sown for the righteous and gladness for the upright in heart? That person is alive. They're hungry. They want the food. They can't. They want. It's, it's not a fleshly compulsion. It's not a. I got to read the word because I feel guilty because I haven't read it. It's like, then you're not reading it for the right reasons. You have a prideful spirit and you're doing it in competitiveness. But you want to know what? I think about Paul the Apostle when he was blinded for three days and Ananias had a dream and Jesus spoke to him and said, Ananias, I want you to go to the house of Judas on Straight Street for, uh, for Saul of Tarsus is there. For behold, he prayeth. You know, he sat there for three days in darkness because God put a separation. He said he saw Jesus and pow, he lost his sight because he that was the last thing he was going to see for three days in his mind is that glorified Christ, that revelation of Jesus Christ. And so when he was in that darkness for three days, it was like Jesus telling the Pharisees, when they said, show us a sign and we will believe, he said, no sign is going to be given unto you except for that of Jonas, uh, who was in the whale. He was in th three, uh, three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And so three days and three nights, Paul the apostle sat in that darkness. God put a division in that man. So that, and what was he doing? He was praying. I would love to be there to hear. I pray that those prayers are recorded that we can read in heaven because I'm planning on saying, Lord, I know you wrote down that prayer and I want you to take me into the hall of records in heaven. And I want you to find that book for me. And I want to see what Paul the apostle prayed for three days where Saul of Tarsus was then allowed to see again. But when he opened, those scales fell from his eyes he was seeing another world. He saw another world when he said above 14 years ago, he saw there was a man, I don't know whether in this world or, or out of this world. He describes two worlds, whether, you know, in body or the spirit, he goes, I don't know, one caught up to the in paradise, to the third heaven, who saw and heard things that are not lawful for me to speak about. And so I believe that when he saw that other world and before that, he saw Jesus Christ in his glory that he was a separated man. He was a man that God put a division between this world and the other world. And I believe that his tenacity, his tenaciousness was not so much that he loved people. And though he told them, I, though I love you, uh, I, I love you, the less I'm loved, you know, um, it's because the more you love the Lord is because you're getting more revelation in his light. And the more you're dwelling in his light, it says in the word with ye, with thee is the fountain of life in thy light shall we see light. He is the light of the world. When the light of Christ comes and shines upon you, there is a division between you and the darkness of Satan and his false light. Once you have tasted of the Lord. You know that you once you taste anything else, you've tasted it. You it's gone into your sensories, and you now now know now anything you ever taste again, you'll say that's counterfeit. There's something it tastes like it, but it's not the real thing. Christ in the revelation in His light, you see that light of that other world. So when He says, "For all that is in the world," He talks about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. You know, look, there's a lust that never is satisfied. It's like the, it says there are three things that are never satisfied for that, that say it is not enough. The grave, the barren womb, um, it says, no, the, um, the grave, 
the barren womb, uh, the earth that saith it is not enough, and there's one more, um, the fire that saith not enough, and so forth. It's in Proverbs, but it talks about the grave that says not enough. It's always filling up Hades, the intermediary compartment of the wicked dead is always opening its mouth, receiving the multitude and enlarging itself. But we see that there's another world. Be, you know, and knowing that this world, why put your love on everything that's been corrupted by Satan? Don't touch it. Don't love it. Don't want it. Don't taste it. Don't handle it. Don't touch it. Don't smell it. It's like the drunkard in Psalm 22. It says, uh, Proverbs 22, it says about the man who looks in the cup and the wine and it, he sees its color and it sparkles in the cup and it moveth itself aright and he starts to drink it and he becomes intoxicated. And that's exactly what happens is Satan will intoxicate you with that lust that he is touching you with and tempting you with. And when you are intoxicated with the lust of the flesh, that is, I can write a paper with a hundred thousand words on it about where Satan can touch you with that lust of the flesh and you know something that lust has to be brought under the power of the holy spirit and the lust of the eyes right because it says the eye is never satisfied neither is hell and the eye though that has been seen by revelation i'm not talking about these eyes i'm talking about your spiritual eyes when your spiritual eyes have been opened and you see the lord in your spirit your eyes now have seen him and you want no counterfeits and now a division happens to you because by the revelation of the holy spirit's power a division is constantly happening in you as you're growing up in jesus christ he says the world passeth away and the lust thereof look this world is slated for judgment there's a belief out there that, you know, if we can just uh, get the right person in office, no person in office is going to fix this. No former person, no new person. It's done. What we're facing right now is complete annihilation of the world that we know. There's going to be nothing left. There's going to be a food deletion. I mean, I've been listening to Mike Adams and he's talking about uh, diesel oil. Uh, no more diesel oil. There is a drought. There's a worldwide drought. Are you aware of the fact that right now the Nile as well as the Euphrates are almost completely dried up? Okay, Ezekiel, Zechariah, Isaiah all talk about the future of that river drying up. God even says in Zechariah, he said, I will dry up that river. Check it out. That tells you what time we're in because it says little children it is the last time and as ye have heard that antichrist shall come he said even now are there many antichrists whereby we know that it is the last time do you know it see because when you know it you're going to want to work to put a division because you do have a responsibility on your part you just can't expect the holy spirit to do everything for you you're not a baby anymore there comes a point where you say, I have to have Christ for myself. I'm going to discipline myself. I'm going to read his word. I'm going to grab a hold of his garment. I'm going to follow my, I, I, you know, where you say like David did, my soul followeth hard after him. Where you start to own your faith, where you start to be able to save your own self. I know that my redeemer liveth. I know that the Lord will maintain the cause and the right of the afflicted. You know why? Because you know him for yourself. Because there comes a time when the Holy Spirit starts to be doing that division in you. It's because he's putting more light inside of you. It says in Proverbs 4.18, it says, um, uh, the path of the, right, the just is like the first gleam of dawn or like the shining light, the rising sun that shineth more and more into the perfect day. That perfect day is eternity. You are traveling on a road to eternity. This world is not your home. And so when he says, um, we know that it is the last time, 
And that Antichrist, I do believe, he's soon to who he is soon to appear. There's, I'm not going to get into the whole thing. So many people will say, well, I don't believe he's a literal man. I fully believe he's a literal man. Um, Daniel talks about him as a literal man. Um, Isaiah speaks about him as a literal man. Uh, you know, we, uh, I forgot, uh, Zachari uh, um, not Zachariah, the other Z. Uh, <laughs> well, he speaks about him as uh, the evil idol shepherd. Uh, we know that he is spoken of in Revelation chapter 13. We know that he is he, he is personified. He has a false prophet. So I don't buy into the fact that, oh, well, there's the spirit of it. Now, there's always a spirit of antichrist. There's a Christ resistors, Christ rejectors, atheists, people that say, I don't want nothing to do with him, okay? And so that is a spirit of Antichrist that has always been in the world since the fall. But there is a man of sin coming. But let me go on. It says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. If they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Look, God is going to make manifest who is of him and who is not. You know, there's so many people who compromise groups of people that they're with, okay? And so they always remain jelly-like. They're they're very, they don't really, they're, they're unstable. Um, they're like, well, I don't know. I just kind of just, I know they don't really speak the truth completely, but I like the people. It's like, there comes a time where you personally, and I'm saying this, and this might sound harsh, and I don't mean it to be, but in a way I do. You're going to stand alone at the judgment seat of Jesus Christ, and they're not going to be with you. And what are you going to tell Jesus then? Because you know what it says in the law? Follow thou not a crowd to do evil. Just because people name the name of Jesus Christ doesn't mean they're of Christ. There, there's another Jesus, like I was talking about, where he says, um, for he, verse 4, For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if ye have received another spirit that ye, uh, ye have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. So you see a lot of people, they just want to be part of a crowd. Don't just be part of a crowd. Your eternal life depends on it. Because Jesus takes it seriously. There are three loves mentioned about in the New Testament. It is the love of money the love of the world and the lovers of pleasure and god is saying he's jealous he's even the spirit envies he's that's another word for his jealous he he's intensely jealous of your love the love of god for your love for god you know jesus prays that he said father i pray that the love that you have for me may be in them and them and me and let me tell you something, God is not going to share house with another spirit in you. He's not. He's not going to be made to serve with your sins. You know, when it says in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, he says, Know ye not, and this is verse 9 through 11. He says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators nor idolaters. And those are lovers of the world, lovers of pleasure, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, right? Lovers of things, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetousness, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of God. See, there has to always be a division. God is holy. Jesus Christ, God is holy. The triune Godhead is holy. And his holiness is at work to make you holy. And so when you start to love this world, and you start to lust after the things of it, then you start to really pretty much quickly depart from the living God. And you'll wander out of the way of understanding and wind up in the congregation of the dead. Is that where you want to be? You know, I say this with a mother's heart to you because I feel this love for you all in my heart like a mother that I would tell you is my own children don't love this world, love Christ. He prepared a place for us to go. And he said, 
if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, ye may be also. And you want to know tonight may be the last night you live. Somebody listening right now, it may be your last day on earth. You may have a heart attack, a car accident. You may just be taken just like that in your sleep because it is appointed unto men once to die and thereafter the judgment. And you want to know that your life right now is clean before Christ. Like he said, and such were some of you, but you can be washed and sanctified and justified. You can go to Jesus Christ and you can separate yourself from this world. So I want to also say this in 1 Corinthians 11, 18 through 19. Paul says, for first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you that they which are approved may be manifest among you. Look, God has to have a litmus test among everybody. You know, anybody nowadays just says, well, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. But they live like these people that Paul was talking to in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Now, I know that everybody, there's times that you can backslide. There's times that you get caught up in something. Just be quick. Just be quick to get yourself out of it. Because let me tell you something, Satan plays for keeps. Satan's not fooling around. He's not messing around. And you'll dangle something that's going to... Um, it's called the pleasures of sin for a season and it's going to feel good. And you know what it is? It's a trap. And because once he gets your foot in the door or his foot in your door, he is ruthless and he will stop at nothing. And then you're going to find yourself down at the bottom of some demonic barrel. You don't want to find yourself there, brothers and sisters. So I admonish you in the Lord. Don't love this world. Don't love anything in it. It's perishing. You know, um, something happens, and this is what I want to say in closing. Something happens when a division begins to take place. There is a maturity. It's a sign of growth where you say, I'm going up to the mountain alone. I got to be alone with Christ. I want to hear Jesus Christ for myself because, see, I was thinking the other day, prayer, okay? Prayer is not a gift. It's not listed in the gift, gifts, I don't think. Let me, read, let, you know, quote, let me think about that again. Um, but he, there's a gift of faith, right? There's a gift of faith. There's um, a gift of healing. There's all these different gifts, right? Let me see here. Um, there's, it says, uh, diversities of gifts, the same spirit, di differences of administration, same Lord, di diverse, uh, diversities of operations, and so on, wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, working miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, tongues, interpretation. So it doesn't ever say that is a gift, though we, we, we consider it a mighty gift, right? But it's something that should be as you're breathing. Can we say that our breath is a gift? Yeah, well, I guess we can say, yes, our breathing is a gift. But when you think about what prayer is, think about Paul the Apostle, Saul of Tarsus, blind, laying in somebody's house on a bed, refusing to eat. And all he's doing is praying. Something is quickened in you and comes alive. That That is, and I believe, uh, I call that the first cry of the newborn. And the more you start to talk, the more it, it's like pie shaped and it gets larger and larger. And you see, when you pray to God, I look at that as sojourning in heaven, that we are of Christ. We are in heaven by Jesus Christ. And that to me, I got such a revelation of that, that it made my praying to God so rich and alive and wonderful. And so immediate and his presence so real and a knowing so I can say along with them, I know, I know that God hears me. I know that in his own way and style, he will answer me. I know that the Lord loves me. I know and you can start saying, I know that his word is true. I know you could say that, right? And so in closing, I want to say that. Something happens when you see all the people that 
God divided unto himself, that's when they become mighty. And you know what? They were independent. They were brave. And they loved getting together with the brethren. They loved preaching, teaching, sharing, eating with each other because they're strengthening in that. There's a refreshment in that. But then you want to go and you want to be alone with the Lord and you only want him to teach you. You get to that point where you say, I got to hear from him. I will hear from him. You know, um, I think of something George Mueller said before he died. and It was his last. He was a man separated to God that he was being interviewed in his last interview. He said, um, uh, a man said, so it's clear we know that all your prayers were answered and you had a diary and it's you wrote down all these things and God answered all your prayers and he said is there one prayer that God has not answered and he said well there is one but I know he'll answer it and he says well how do you know he's going to answer it you know I'm, you're, you're this age and he said you're in your 90s and I mean what if you die the possibility is real that you could die without seeing it answered and he said no he said, well, that's okay. If I die, I know he'll answer it. And he goes, but how can you be sure? How can you say he will answer you? He said quietly, because I asked him. Do you see that? That is a man separated unto God. That beautiful simplicity, that godly sincerity, because I asked him. And at his funeral, he was, and he asked him, what is the prayer? He said, I've been praying for what somebody that works with me for his son for 25 years. And at that funeral, there was a call made for salvation. And that young man stood up and he went forward. I don't know how young he was, but that man went forward and he turned his life over to Jesus Christ and became a separated man. So. I want to share this. This was from a woman who was always listening. She gave me her permission. It was long ago. Her name is Lisa Roma. And she wrote something that was so beautiful. I was like, I'm keeping this. And is it okay if I share it? And she said, yes. And that was a long time ago. She said, if you really think about all our walks, meaning those in the body of believers, it is overwhelming to think about the divine interventions we all have had. I'm thinking about the stone that sealed the tomb of Jesus. His disciples were hopeless, disillusioned, and their expectations dashed. That stone represented the world triumphing over them with the death of Jesus. His body sealed in behind that great stone. But God, an angel, the imminence of another world than this one, rolled the stone away. There is another world entirely in close touch with this one mightier than it acting in relation to the purposes of god centered in his son impossible situations are god's specialty divine interventions are our normal she's a separated one be a separated one unto god i tell you there is no greater joy no greater power, no greater freedom than to break away and run your own race and just go after God running in the path of his commandments. Amen. Be separated unto God and do not love this world. It's passing away. And the other one is the world we're entering into. And that is the world without end.